The writings of St. Ignatius Bryanchaninov on the fallen angels and on ways to combat them. The Holy Apostle Paul says to all Christians, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This struggle is terrible. It is a matter of life and death. The outcome of this conflict must be either our eternal salvation or our eternal perdition. The malicious spirits, rankling with bitter hatred for the human race, wage this warfare with extreme obduracy and infernal skill. The Holy Apostle Peter says, Your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But true lovers of God cannot possibly be separated from God by the fallen angels, even though they employ all their powers to effect this separation. They use all their ingenuity to separate us from God because the separation means our perdition. In order to stand firm against the spirits of evil and overcome them by the grace of God, it is necessary to know exactly who they are, how to deal with them, and the conditions of victory and defeat. The malicious spirits are fallen angels. God created them with the other angels. He created them pure, good, and holy. And he lavished upon them many gifts of nature and grace. But darkened by pride, the spirits ascribed to themselves their abundant skills, their exquisite virtues, the very gifts of grace. They excluded themselves from the category of creatures and affirmed that they were self-existent beings forgetting about their creation. And on this disastrous basis, they spurned their sacred duties to God, their creator. They were drawn away to this presumption and self-deception by one of the chief angels whom the holy prophet Ezekiel called a cherub, and whom all the saints in general number among the highest angels. This cherub became so inflated with presumption and pride that he considered himself equal to God, openly rebelled against God, became the adversary of God, the raging enemy of God. The spirits who refused obedience to God fell from heaven. They creep over the earth and fill the space between earth and heaven. Hence, they are called the spirits of the air, since the air is their habitat. They descend into hell, to the interior of the earth. All this is recorded in Holy Scripture. The number of fallen angels is very considerable. Some suppose, basing themselves on the evidence of the apocalypse, that a third of the angels fell from heaven. Many of the highest angels fell, as is seen from the words of the holy apostle Paul cited above. He calls them principalities and powers. The head and prince of the kingdom of darkness, composed of fallen angels, is the fallen cherub. Excelling in the talents of every fallen angel, he excels them all in malice and evil. Naturally, the spirits allured by him, as well as those who obey him voluntarily, must constantly borrow evil from him, and consequently be in servitude to him. Leaving to the choice of the fallen angels their voluntary continuance in evil, God, in his omnipotence and wisdom, which infinitely surpasses the intelligence of all intelligent creatures, does not cease to remain their supreme sovereign Lord. They are in the will of God as though in unbreakable chains, and they can only do what God permits them to do. In the place of the fallen angels, God created a new rational creature, man, and he placed him in paradise, which was in a lower heaven and which was previously under the jurisdiction of the fallen cherub. So paradise came under the control of the new creature, man, Thus, it is very understandable that the new creature became an object of envy and hatred to the fallen angel and his satellites. The reprobate spirits, led by their chief, tried to seduce the newly created men to make them share their fall, and so as to have adherents or associates of the same mind. And they endeavored to inflict them with the poison of their hatred for God. In this, they succeeded. Although man was deceived and seduced, yet he voluntarily refused obedience to God. 
voluntarily consented to the diabolic blasphemy against God, voluntarily entered into fellowship with the fallen spirits and into obedience to them. So he fell from God and from the company of holy spirits to whom he belonged not only in soul but also in his spiritual body. And he joined the company of spirits fallen in soul and body to the state of irrational and dumb animals. The crime committed by the fallen angels against men finally decided the fate of the fallen angels. The mercy and grace of God was finally withdrawn from them, and they set the seal on their fall. The fallen spirit is doomed to creep and crawl in thoughts and feelings that are exclusively carnal and material. It is incapable of raising itself from the earth. It cannot rise to anything spiritual. Such is the meaning, according to the explanation of the Holy Fathers, of the sentence pronounced by God on the fallen angel after the angel had infected newly created man with internal death. On your belly you shall go, said God to the demon, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Although man was reckoned among the fallen angels, his fallen account of the way in which it took place assumed quite a different character from that of the angels. The angels fall consciously, deliberately, intentionally. They themselves are the cause of the evil within them. Having committed one transgression, they madly rush to another. For these reasons, they were completely deprived of good, were filled with overflowing evil, and have only evil as their nature. Man fell unconsciously, unintentionally. He was deceived and seduced. For this reason, his natural goodness was not destroyed, but was mixed with the evil of the fallen angels. But this natural goodness, being mixed with evil, poisoned with evil, became worthless, inadequate, unworthy of God who is perfect, purest goodness. Man, for the most part, does evil, meaning to do good, not seeing the evil wrapped in a mask of goodness on account of the darkening of his mind and conscience. The fallen spirits do evil for the sake of evil, finding enjoyment and fame in doing evil. God in his unspeakable goodness has given fallen man a redeemer and redemption. But redeemed man has also been given freedom either to avail himself of the redemption granted him and return to paradise, or to refuse redemption and remain in the company of the fallen angels. The time assigned to man to express his mind and peace is the whole of our life on earth. By redemption, man is restored to the fellowship with God. But he is given full liberty to express his will, so it is left to his choice to remain in this fellowship or to break it off. And he is not deprived of the possibility of fellowship with the fallen angels, a fellowship into which he entered voluntarily. While man is in this uncertain state throughout the whole of his earthly life, the grace of God does not cease to assist him till the very moment of his departure to eternity if he wants it. And the fallen angels do not cease to make every endeavor to hold him in their fellowship as their prisoner and as a slave of sin in eternal death and ruin. The reprobate spirit often tried to tempt even the holy martyrs and saintly monks after they had accomplished the greatest penances and miracles just before their end in sight, so to speak, of the heavenly crowns. Very true is the thought which we meet in the writings of many of the holy fathers, that a monk is in danger of being exposed to some temptation till his very grave, and never knows where it may spring from or what form it may take. Holy Church teaches us that every Christian receives from God at holy baptism a holy guardian angel who invisibly guards the Christian, guides him to every good work throughout the whole course of his life, and reminds him of the commandments of God. So too, there is a prince of darkness who wants to drag the whole human race to its ruin and who assigns to each person one of the evil spirits who follows the person everywhere and tries to draw him into every form of sin. From what has been said, it is clear that a monk should keep vigilant watch over himself throughout his life and should be filled with both fear and courage. He should be in a constant state of caution and and fear on account of his enemy and murderer, and at the same time he should always be bold and courageous from the conviction that continually near him is his mighty helper, his guardian angel. St. Poemen the Great says, 
The great help of God surrounds a man, but he is not allowed to see it. The reason why he is not allowed to see it, of course, is lest he should rely on that help and become careless and negligent and give up his vigorous ascetic life with its struggles and exploits. The fallen angel, doomed to creep on earth, uses all his ingenuity to make man crawl on earth too. Man is extremely prone to this on account of the self-deception that nestles within him. He has a sense of his eternity, but as this feeling is distorted by his falsely named reason and evil conscience, man's earthly life also seems to him everlasting. On the basis of this illusory, false, ruinous judgment, man gives himself up entirely to the cares and labors of arranging his life on earth, forgetting that he is a passing pilgrim in this world, and that his permanent abode is either heaven or hell. Sacred scripture says to God in the person of fallen man, My soul cleaveth to the dust. I give me life. O oh, give me life according to thy word. From these words it is clear that attachment to the earth deadens the soul with eternal death. It is revived by the word of God which, by tearing it away from the earth, lifts its thoughts and feelings to heaven. The devil, says St. John Chrysostom, about the fallen angel, is shameless and insolent. He attacks from below, yet even so he often wins, but that is only because we do not try to raise ourselves to where he is powerless to wound us. For he cannot raise himself high, but creeps over the earth, and that is why the serpent is his type or image. And if God set him crawling at the beginning of things, he is all the more so now. But if you do not know what it means to attack from below, I will try to explain it to you. It means to steal upon you and master you by using low things, by means of pleasures, riches, and all that is earthly. So if the devil sees someone soaring to heaven, first, he is not in a position to attack him, and second, if he does not risk attacking, he soon falls, because he has not a leg to stand on. He does not do not be afraid of him. He has no wings. He only crawls over the earth and creeps among earthly things. So have nothing in common with earth. Then there will be no need even of labor. The devil cannot fight openly, but just as a snake hides in thorns, so he mostly lurks in the delusions of wealth. If you cut out the thorns, he will soon be scared and take to flight. If you can exercise him with divine charms, you will easily strike him. And we do have, we surely have spiritual charms, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the cross. St. Macarius the Great, learning that a certain monk named Theopemptus was being tempted by impure thoughts induced by the devil. And he gave Theopemptus the following advice. Fast till evening, so as to feel real hunger. Learn the heart, learn by heart the gospel and other books of Holy Scripture, so as to remain always in the thought of God. If an evil thought comes to you, do not accept it. Never allow your mind to be dragged down, but always raise it on high, and God will help you. A brother asked Abba Sisoes, What should I do in order to be saved and please God? The elder replied, if you want to please God, quit the world, relinquish the earth, leave creatures, and come to the Creator. Unite yourself with God by prayer and weeping, and you will find rest in this and the future life. St. Barsanufius the Great wrote to a certain brother, If you want to be saved, force yourself to die to everything earthly. Regard yourself as nothing, and strive for what lies ahead, lest under the pretext of a good work, the devil involve you in untimely worries. The wily serpent, skilled in the struggle with men and their destruction, does not always resort to powerful expedients to attain his end. Why use them when they may arouse in a monk vigorous resistance and afford him a glorious victory, as is proved by many experiences? Weak expedients act more surely. They are for the most part not noticed, and, even if noticed, they are ignored on account of their outward insignificance and apparent harmlessness. Generally speaking nowadays, in the devil's warfare against Christianity and monasticism, powerful ex 
expedients are in fact not seen, but only weak shifts. No longer do the Saracens and Latins attack Orthodox monasteries. No longer are monks burned and killed in order to destroy Orthodox monasticism. It is destroyed by imperceptible snares in which it is caught extremely easily according to the custom of our time. Earthly Occupations When a monk devotes himself to them with enthusiasm, even without obvious sins, are quite capable of depriving him of success and progress and of desolating his unfortunate soul. Such a soul becomes an abode of demons, according to the witness of the gospel. When the heart of a tree is infected with rot, then the tree is gradually and imperceptibly ruined, though its exterior for a long time continues to maintain its beauty without showing the inner death that is eating it away. Weak expedients, without touching the exterior of monasticism, destroy its essence. What is a monk? Is he not a Christian who has separated himself from everything and become united in heart and mind in order to belong to God alone and has entered into inseparable fellowship with him? But where is the monk when he is estranged from God and attached to the earth? Among the number of weak expedients, yet whose effect is extremely powerful, belong various forms of handiwork and bodily labor, when a monk engages in them excessively and with attachment, and this happens time after time with self-appointed occupations not undertaken by obedience. In these occupations, attachment to them imperceptibly creeps in. At first, special attention and zeal is shown for the work. Then the monk devotes all his powers of soul and body to the work, while he forgets and forsakes God. Meanwhile, the snake tries to make the monk imagine that his occupation is innocent, even soul-saving and generally useful. By the serpent's cunning, praises and approbations for his work begin to reach the monk's ears from all sides. He is infected with conceit. His soul, unenlightened by the word of God, is wrapped in the darkness of ignorance and stupidity. He acts under the full control of the fallen spirit. When a soul abandons his spiritual exercises, or what amounts to the same thing, performs them listlessly, perfunctorily, and coldly, and employs himself solely, or principally, with attachment and enthusiasm in earthly occupations, then the passions belonging to our fallen nature have free play in the heart with nothing to disturb them. They grow, enlarge, increase in scope and freedom. Then the monk enjoys an illusory calm, consoling himself with conceit and vainglory and thinking it is the consolation of grace. Those who do not wrestle with their passions leave them undisturbed. And even if the passions are disturbed for a short time, one who is unaccustomed to self-scrutiny pays no attention to it and merely tries to calm the passions by some earthly distraction. Such calm, or more accurately, spiritual sleep, without compunction, without remembrance of death and judgment, heaven and hell, without concern to obtain God's mercy and good time and be reconciled and united with Him, the Holy Father's call insensibility, deadening of the soul, death of the spirit while the body is still alive. During the terrible slumber of the soul, the passions, and especially those of the soul, grow to incredible dimensions, and acquire strength and power beyond natural capacities. The monk perishes without his noticing it. St. John Cassian, who visited the monasteries of Egypt at the end of the 4th or beginning of the 5th century at a time when monasticism was particularly flourishing and shone with a galaxy of spiritual lights, relates that the monks of the Egyptian desert called Kalaman, which was at a very considerable distance from worldly settlements and was practically inaccessible to people of the world, showed far less success and progress in the monastic life than the monks of the deserts of Sketis, which was not far from worldly habitations or even from the crowded city of Alexandria. The cause of this, St. John Cassian sees in the following. The desert of Sketis was the most barren, and so its monks were not distracted either by cultivation of the land or by contemplation of the beauties of nature. They remained in the silence of their cells, occupied with the simplest kinds of handiwork, continuing constantly in prayer, in reading and studying the Word of God, and in discerning the thoughts and feelings that arose within them. By leading such a concentrated life, they soon obtained success, 
and their progress reached the, the highest degree of perfection. On the other hand, Kalamon was an extensive fertile island, an oasis in the desert resembling paradise, with plenty of magnificent trees and large numbers of plants of various kinds suited to the tropical climate. The island was surrounded on all sides by a vast sea of sand, so it could be justly called the Sandy Steppe, in the midst of which was Kalamon. It was extremely difficult to access. The monks of Kalamon, attracted by the conveniences of the place, were largely occupied in gardening and agriculture. The beauty of nature offered many opportunities for distraction. By giving a considerable part of their attention to the earth, they could not apply it wholly to heaven. In the life of St. Sava, who was Archbishop of Serbia, it is said that when he visited the holy solitaries of Athos, he found them entirely free of all earthly occupations. They were not employed in agriculture, vine growing, or the sale of their handiwork. They had no earthly cares or worries whatever. Their one occupation was prayer, tears, and the turning of the mind and heart to God. St. Arsenius the Great was so careful to avoid distraction to some subtle passion such as pride and vague glory, that he wrote neither letters nor books, although he was fully capable and was equipped with learning and spiritual attainment. The great monks of antiquity, such as Anthony the Great, Macadius the Great, and others who were endowed by God with great strength of body and soul, did much handiwork, but their handiwork was so simple and it became so habitual that it did not hinder them in the least from being occupied in prayer at the same time. They so accustomed themselves to their simple handiwork, that their mind was free to be immersed in profound prayer and to be lifted up in vision while their hands continued to work automatically. Their work was so simple and so much a matter of habit that it demanded no attention from the mind whatever. Very many of the ancient monks made rope, others made baskets or rugs and mats. It can be easily seen that even some of our present-day handicrafts need very little attention when we have the skill, for example, knitting socks or stockings. Those who are skilled in this work produce it without looking at it at all, and while knitting they freely occupy their mind with other objects. But other occupations, for instance painting, require great attention. Those who are skilled in painting, even though they can practice it with prayer, yet it is impossible for them to immerse themselves wholly in prayer because their craft requires them frequently to give their full attention to it. Painting arouses great feeling and interest for it in the soul, and then our ardor and inspiration cannot fail to be divided between God and our handicraft. From the examples given, we can judge also about other forms of handiwork. It is vital that the monk's heart should be detached from his handiwork, especially in the case of intellectual occupations liable to divert a person from humility and God, and draw him to pride and ego worship. With occupations of this kind, we should take special care to do our work for the glory of God and for the common good, and not for our vain glory and self-love. It is impossible to work for God and mammon at the same time. It is impossible to work for God and at the same time indulge our own inclinations, predilections, and passions. From what has been said here, we give our beloved brother monks the advice to observe extreme caution with regard to earthly occupations, knowing that the malicious and wily serpent is creeping over the earth, always ready to wound us and pour his deadly poison into us. Novices and probationers should devote themselves with all care and diligence to their appointed obedience for God's sake and for their own salvation, without delighting in its successful accomplishment, without boasting of it, and without developing vainglory, conceit, and pride, whereby obedience is changed from an instrument of salvation into an instrument and means of perdition. One should constantly pray to God for the successful accomplishment of an obedience and ascribe success solely to the mercy and grace of God. And when a monk is given freedom to use a considerable part of his time at his own discretion, he should guard himself from attachment to any kind of material occupation and to all that is earthly and corruptible as from deadly poison. He should unceasingly raise his mind on high. To raise the mind on high does not mean to imagine heavenly dwellings, angels, the splendor of God, and all that sort of thing. No, such dreaming only gives occasion to diabolic delusion. Without any reverie, let the monk raise his thought with spiritual feeling to the judgment of God. Let him be filled with salutary fear from the conviction that God is present everywhere and knows everything. 
let him weep and confess to God, who is present in his cell, and looking at him. Let him ask in good time for forgiveness and mercy, remembering the multitude of his sins and his imminent death. If the time given for repentance and for obtaining a blessed eternity is wasted in temporal occupations and for earthly gains and acquisitions, it will not be given a second time. Its loss is irreplaceable. Its loss will be bewailed in hell with futile and eternal tears. If during his earthly pilgrimage a person does not break his connection with evil spirits, he will remain in fellowship with them even after his death, more or less belonging to them, depending upon the degree of intercourse. Unbroken intercourse with fallen spirits consigns one to eternal perdition, while insufficiently broken relations render one liable to severe torments on the way to heaven. Look, brethren, look what the devil is doing, has done, and will do, leading the mind of man from the spiritual heaven to material things, chaining the heart of man to earth and earthly pursuits and occupations. Look, and be alarmed with a healthy fear. Look, and beware with necessary soul-saving caution. The fallen spirit busied certain monks with obtaining various rare and costly things. Then, by attaching their minds to these things, he estranged them from God. Others he employed in various studies and arts, anything so long as the aim was earthly. Then, having drawn all their attention to passing studies, he deprived them of the vital and necessary knowledge of God. Others he employed in obtaining for the monastery various improvements, buildings, cultivation of flower gardens, kitchen gardens, pastures, meadows, cattle breeding or dairy farming, and forced them to forget God. Others he occupied in decorating their cells with flowers, pictures, the making of furniture or rosaries, and withdrew them from God. Others he attached to a lathe and taught them to ignore and neglect God. Others he taught to give special attention to their fasting and other bodily exercises and to attribute special significance to dry bread, mushrooms, cabbage, peas, or beans. And in this way, sensible, holy, and spiritual exercises were turned into senseless, carnal, and sinful farces. The ascetic was corrupted and reduced to carnal and falsely called knowledge conceit and contempt for his neighbors which snuffs out the very conditions for progress and holiness and provides the conditions for ruin and perdition others he inspired to attach an exaggerated importance to the material side of church services while obscuring the spiritual side of the rites thus by hiding the essence of christianity from these unfortunate people and leaving them only a distorted material wrapper or covering he enticed them to fall away from the church into the most foolish form of clouded perception, into schism. So easy is this kind of conflict for the fallen spirit that now he employs it everywhere. It is so easy for the devil to ruin men by this kind of warfare that he will make use of it in the last days of the world to draw the whole world away from God. These are the tactics the devil will use, and he will use them with marked success. In the last days of the world, through the influence of of the Lord of the world, men will be full of attachment to the earth and to everything carnal and material. They will give themselves up to earthly cares and material development. They will busy themselves solely with the affairs of the earth as if it were their eternal home. Having become carnal and material, they will forget eternity as if it did not exist. They will forget God and abandon Him. As it was in the days of Noah, our Lord foretold, so will it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed." In order to stand firm against fallen spirits, we need to see them. A struggle is possible only with an opponent who can be sensed by feelings of body or soul. When an enemy is invisible, when his weapons are invisible, when no sensation or feeling gives evidence of his presence and activity, then he is equivalent to a non-existent enemy. Then what battle can there be? Spirits, invisible to our bodily eyes, are visible to the eyes of our soul. 
to our mind and heart. But the Holy Fathers, who had attained purity and perfection, saw the spirits with their bodily eyes as well. For us, who cannot see the fallen spirits with our bodily eyes, it is necessary to learn to see them with the eyes of the soul. To explain how spirits appear to men and how they can be seen by men, we will relate the two following stories. St. Macarius the Great lived the life of a solitary in Sketis in the Egyptian desert. At some distance from his cell was a large community of monks under his direction who lived the life of hermits. Their cells were about a stone's throw apart. Once, the saint was sitting on the path leading to the monk's cells. Suddenly, he saw a devil coming in the form of a man, carrying a lot of crockery. The elder asked, Where are you going? The devil replied, I am going to disturb the brethren. The elder asked, What have you got in those crocks? The devil replied, Food for the brethren. The elder asked, Food and all the crocks? He said, Yes, if one kind of food does not suit a person, I give him another, and then a third, and so on with all the foods, one after another, so that each may taste at least one. So saying, the devil went on his way, while the elder stayed on the path and waited for him to return. When he saw him coming back, the elder said to him, Be well! How can it be well with me? he replied. Why is that? asked the elder. Because, replied the devil, all the monks were ill-disposed toward me, and not one of them received me. The elder said, And so don't you have a single friend among them? The devil replied, I have one friend there who listens to me, but when I come to him and he sees me, he begins to whirl in all directions. The elder asked, What is his name? The devil said, Theopemptus. So saying, he went off. St. Macarius searched out Theopemptus and went into his cell for a talk. He found that the monk had not recognized the devil who had appeared to him and had conversed with him and had enjoyed the thoughts he had brought to him without realizing or suspecting that he had thereby entered into fellowship and most intimate intercourse with the fallen spirit. The saint taught Theopemptus how to struggle with the devil and turn demons from friends into enemies. From the story it is clear that Theopemptus saw the devil, as also the devil attested, but he saw him only with his mind in very sinful thoughts. The devil's coming to Theopemptus was made known by a special influx of obtrusive and seducive thoughts with which he did not know how to deal. This produced a state of perplexity, unrest, and confusion. He conversed with the thoughts evidently without realizing that they were offered by the devil, but supposing that they arose in his own soul. He tried to calm them by reasoning and arguing with them, but he was finally carried away by them and took pleasure in them. In a second example, another great servant of God, St. Macarius of Alexandria, once saw with his bodily eyes a lot of child-sized black demons running and flying about in the church. It was the custom of that community for one monk to read the psalm slowly in the middle of the church while all the rest of the monks sat and listened attentively to him. The saint saw that beside each monk sat a demon who made sport of him. The demons put their fingers on the eyes of one monk and he immediately began to doze. They put their fingers on the mouth of another, and he began to yawn. To some, they appeared in the form of women. Before others, they erected buildings, brought various things, and engaged in various occupations. When the divine service was over, St. Macarius called each brother to him and asked him privately what he had been thinking or dreaming about during the divine worship. It turned out that each had been thinking or dreaming about what the spirits had portrayed before him. From this story, it is evident that spirits influence us not only by means of idle and sinful thoughts, but also by idle and sinful dreams, even by touch and various kinds of contact. All this becomes quite clear in due time from personal experience to a monk leading an attentive life in accordance with the gospel commandments. 
The devils enter our senses and members, says St. John Carpathios. Torment our flesh with the heat of passion. Make us look, hear, and smell lustfully. Inspire us to say what should not be said. Fill our eyes with adultery and throw us into confusion, acting from outside and within us. In order to explain to some extent, for everyone, how spirits, those gas-like or vapory intelligent beings, can enter the members of our body, produce in them their own peculiar effect, attack the very soul and influence it, we shall point out similar action of certain gases. Take the case of suffocation caused by heavy carbonic gas, invisible to our eyes of our senses, which enters and poisons our system by means of the sense of smell. Take the case of alcohol. From the use of wine or other liquor, alcohol passes from the stomach to the body to the head and affects the brain and the mind in a manner that is incomprehensible to us. The alcohol or spirits then passing from the stomach into the blood in a way we now understand produces heating of the blood, or what amounts to the same thing, brings into physical union with caloric, that subtle gaseous material, and subjects both body and soul to the influence of this material. Gaseous materials have the property of entering into hard substances and into other gases, and of passing through them. Thus, a sunbeam passes through the air and through all known gases belonging to the earth, through water, through ice, through glass. Heat easily penetrates through iron and through all metals and produces a change in them. It passes also through those gases through which light passes. Air passes through wood, but it does not pass through glass. Steam and various smells, that is gases, pass through air. St. Macarius the Great says, Ever since, through the transgression of the commandment by the first people in paradise, evil entered into men. The devil has obtained free access always to converse with the soul as man converses with man, and to instill into the heart all that is harmful. The devil converses with a person without using a voice, yet with his words, because thoughts are the same as words, only not uttered by voice, not clothed in sounds without which men cannot communicate their thoughts to each other. In the same word, Macarius the Great says, The devil acts so cunningly that all evil appears to us as if it were born of itself in the soul and not from the extraneous action of an alien spirit acting maliciously and endeavoring to remain hidden. Clear signs of the coming to us and action upon us of the fallen spirit are the sudden appearance of idle and sinful thoughts and fancies, heaviness of the body and an increase of its animal needs, hardening of the heart, arrogance and haughtiness, vainglorious thoughts, rejection of repentance, forgetfulness of death, despondency and boredom, or a special inclination for earthly occupations. The coming of the fallen spirit is always associated with a sense of confusion, disturbance, gloom, and perplexity. Thoughts coming from demons, says Barsanufius the Great, are above all filled with confusion, disquiet, and sadness, and they secretly and subtly draw the soul after them. For the foes wear the clothing of sheep, that is, they suggest thoughts apparently right and true, but... Inwardly, they are ravenous wolves, that is, they ravish and deceive the hearts of the simple by what seems good, but in reality is evil and harmful. The subject is treated in a similar way by all the great guides of monasticism, with monks who stand firmly against the rejected spirits in the warfare that is invisible to the eyes of our senses, in due time, but only with the permission of God who does all for our good, the spirits enter into open combat. Since they are volatile beings without flesh and bones, they assume the forms of various wild beasts and animals, reptiles and insects, in size both very large and very small. 
They try to terrify monks, unsettle and derange them, give them a high opinion of themselves, even cast them into a ruinous state called diabolic delusion. Humble surrender to the will of God, discernment and readiness to endure all the sufferings that God may permit, complete disregard and distrust of all words, actions, and apparitions of fallen spirits, effectually frustrate their endeavors. Attention to them and trust in them always cause the greatest harm, and often the monk's ruin. By struggling aright with the spirits, the soul of a monk derives abundant profit and makes special progress. St. Macarius the Great says, For babes in spirit, the prince of this world is a rod that punishes and a whip that causes wounds. Yet, in this way, as was said above, by means of trials and temptations, he procures great honor and glory for them, for he thus helps them to attain perfection, while he prepares for himself the most grievous torment. The devil, being a slaving creature of God, does not tempt us as much as he likes, nor does he let loose his fury as much as he wishes, but as so far as God permits and allows him. For God, knowing perfectly everything about everyone and how much strength each person has, allows each to be tempted according to his powers. One who has a living faith in God and who surrenders himself to God with self-renunciation remains untroubled in all trials and temptations caused by evil spirits and sees in the fiends only the blind tools of divine providence. Without paying any attention to them during trials caused by them, he surrenders himself entirely to the will of God. Surrender to the will of God is a calm, restful haven in all trials and afflictions.